just a, a verse here from Psalm, ooh, Psalm 62. Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2, 5 and 6. If you want to go there. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In uh, these two scriptures we have this Two thoughts, or three thoughts. Our soul should wait upon God because our expectation, our salvation, comes from Him. And because He is the rock and our salvation and our defense, we will not be moved. He gives us the strength and courage to stand. <clears throat> but it's as we wait, as we wait upon the Lord, as we trust in Him, do we find his grace sufficient? Now, what I want to do right now is I'm going to sing a song. And it's very interesting because um, it's something that I'd written probably years ago. And it was probably went to some tune hymn. I don't remember what it is now. I went hunting for that. And... <clears throat> I sat down at the piano, I don't know if it was yesterday sometime, and, or the night before, and God began to help me with, with new music. So, um, this maybe encapsules what I want us to think about. Waiting on God, really getting a hold of God. And this is where I've been at the last few weeks, and it has to do... And I'm going to bring up a couple of things, and I want it to be open for discussion. Um, but I want us to think about who we are individually in Christ, who we are as a church, why we're here. And if anything is going to happen, how is it going to happen in our lives? And part of it is found in this, this song that tells us the importance that we need to know God. We need to know him personally, intimately. <clears throat> if we are to be faithful to what he's called us to. Uh, that's very interesting. We found that the other day. That's one of my needed, <laughs> needed notes. start this over. Praise the Lord. What I wanted us to understand, one of the things I want to talk about is we have to, and I'll ask the question and ask a little bit, what do you expect a church should be like? What are the elements in a church service? What do you expect should happen? And uh, uh, should it be ritualistic? Should it be tight? Should it be free? I, I want to get your input. That's one of the first things I'm going to ask here in a moment, okay? But because I, that's why I, I want you to know, I want us to find our freedom in Christ and not be bound by, um, we have to get this done, we have to get that done, it has to be a certain order. We don't have a real order here anyway, but sometimes we come to church and we think, oh, we've got, we, we need to have this, we need to have that. <laughs> what we need is God. So... <clears throat> Mankind is sought to understand the 
ways of truth, the paths of faith. But if they wait and seek God's face, He will reveal His truth and grace. The hearts of men desire great life, but all they find are ways of strife. Yet as they wait upon the Lord, they in abundant life go forth. To wait upon the Lord is trust, to rest in His redeeming work, and daily there before the Lord, He sanctifies the quiet soul. Our calling is the Lord to know, to hear His voice and follow so, and humbly every word obey in all we do and all we say. the quiet soul. To wait upon the Lord is trust, to rest in His redeeming work, and daily there before the Lord He sanctifies the quiet soul, he satisfies the quiet soul. <clears throat> okay. What are your ideas of church? What should church be? What, what do you expect to happen in church? Building each other up. Yes. What would that entail? What, that's iron, a, sharpening iron. iron sharpening iron, yeah. But I, I thought of something. When you said the first statement, building each other up, I, I didn't think of iron sharpening sh iron. That's kind of like hitting you a verse and you hit me back with a verse and you know sharpening the iron <clears throat> it's encouragement isn't it just encouraging one another if somebody's discouraged if somebody's under burden or weight sometimes the spirit will help us to know to, to minister to them maybe we don't know but we, we go over and we shake hands or we get a hug and, and we say, I've been thinking of you this week, or I've been praying for you. We can pray for one another. This is what should be encouraging one another. Building up one another. That's good. And the, and the other, iron sharpening iron is, is a great way too. <clears throat> um, there's an a example I came up with, um, or used in the past, you know where, where Jesus says we need to wash one another's feet. He told the disciples that. Well, we don't need to wash our feet the way they did, did back then because they walked around in sandals and dusty roads. They didn't have paved roads. Now, some of the Roman roads were stone. Wouldn't have been too dusty, but they walked. Sometimes they walked across fields. They walked through fields, climbed up over rocks and stuff. Their feet were dirty. 
So it was just uh, the host would take and wash the disciples' feet. Well, we don't need to do that today, but there's ways. And what, what is the, the implication there is when they walked through the world, dust got on them. They got a little bit of dirt on them. They weren't really unclean, but, you know, uh, but they, they're just dust. And when we walk through daily living, you go to a, a, a grocery store or some, some store somewhere, and they have this music on. It's worldly music. And that's dust on your soul. That's dust. That's a little bit of uncleanness. And you didn't mean to pick it up. It just got on you. You're walking through the field. Don't mean to get dirty feet. Jasmine somewhere got dirt on her feet. She put them in her good shoes. The dirt's in there. So when she comes back later, she sticks her good shoes on. She gets dirt on them. That's what she just experienced this morning. Okay, I don't know. But it just you can see the, the illustration there. And uh, you're at work. And somebody lets out a string of expletives. And, and you, you say, Jesus, help me. That's dust on your soul, on your mind. When people are angry and carnal around us, it's dust. You, again, you walk down you're in a store, uh, coming up the cash register, and all those magazines, you just kind of have to look up, <laughs> literally Jesus, or billboards and things like that. It's all dust. It's not, we didn't mean to go there, and, and by God's grace, we didn't fall into the temptation to look and, oh, wow. We didn't go there. But it's dust on us. And sometimes we need to clean our own feet, mm -hmm. you shower and get clean. Other times we're in a place and we need somebody else to wash our feet. And we do that by encouragement. Maybe, and I want us to, I want us to, to see when I'm talking about church, I initially said, you know, this meeting place here, but it, 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 goes all out because we need to be doing what, what Scott said throughout the week too. But if God prompts our heart to call somebody, we need to call them or visit them, encourage them, have prayer, exhort them in the Lord. You know, continue on. Brother, you know, God's helping you. Continue on. You're going to make it. Uh, parents can do it toward their children. We can wash our, our children's feet. That's a blessing that we can give them. We can bless into their lives. Children, you can bless your parents when you tell them that you love them. When You, you can wash their, your parents' feet if you just do what they tell you to do. <laughs> it'll, be so, it'll lift all kinds of things off of them. Do you, you understand that principle? So that's one way we can wash each other's feet today. And when we meet together, specifically in church and in prayer meeting, we have that opportunity. So what else? What else would be happening? Yes. 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 You, you got it right on. Although we, we shouldn't, I mean, there's times when the Lord might say, well, you, you need to get the basins of water out and, and some towels and wash one another's feet. And there have been some very moving experiences when, when that's been done. Uh, I think we have to be careful. This is one of those things we don't make a ritual of everything. Okay, every uh, third Sunday we're going to have foot washing. You know, we, we don't want to be locked in. Uh, but you're right. It is we learn to serve one another. But it's, this is exactly what, what Scott has said, though. To build up one another is to serve them to lift them, to help them, to come underneath them. And ultimately, that's what Jesus did with us. He was giving that example there. Jesus got clear down below his disciples. And they were probably dumbfounded. They, just, they were probably going inside. They all wanted to say what Peter said. No, Lord, you can't wash my feet. They let him do it because they could tell he was determined. But yes, you're correct on that. Something else. What should be happening? You've got. I think the Lord makes us all different. He gives us different talents, things that we're not good at.
I how much I try to make my quiet time like that. Mm. I like to write. And I don't I wouldn't say that I have a gift for writing, but i I look at it as as um, I'll read a lesson and I'll put down my thoughts to it. Figuring out what is this for my grandkids and I'm doing it so much for myself. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's, it's, it's the thing of, of how God builds, bless us, have the opportunities to build into other people's lives and, or, and to be open enough to allow other people to build into ours. And that's, that's what Norma and I came here to this church the first time. Um, really different from where we came from. And I remember, look, we got in the car. We pulled out and I looked at her and I said, what do you think? <laughs> she, was, you know, I mean, she was right on. We both had a feeling here of, of love and acceptance. And, and Praise the Lord. It is. And you just hit upon something there. Two things. You, 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 probably more than two things you hit upon. But I want to pull from what you just said, said. The importance of gifts and abilities. Um, too often, we, the expectation many people come to church is they're there, we're going to come and we're going to worship and that's about as much as they're going to participate. Um, they're not going to want to enter into, you know, they're not going to want to be called on to pray. And it doesn't mean that God's going to call on everybody, but sometimes He wants somebody to pray. And, um, but they're going to sit and they're going to listen to this man if they talk. And I know I, it's easy for me to talk. So, but the idea here is that we're come to worship the Lord, all of us, with who we are. Who did God make us to be? And um, if the church is being built as we participate, most of the time, and we each have our own little brick, <clears throat> uh, most of the time what's happening in church, people carry in their brick. And there's, they see this pile over there, so everybody piles up their brick. It's got their name on it so they can find it when they're ready to leave. And then they go off and, and sit down and watch the person up front hold his gift, or if they get the singing group up front, they're holding their or their brick, you know, holding their brick up and participating, and then they put it down and they mortar it together, so you have a little, little tiny little wall here of five or six bricks. You know, we have a pianist, we have a pastor, uh, children's story, uh, teller, and uh, that's about it. The rest of you, the rest of the people, have their bricks all over there in a pile. They're just observing. They haven't participated. They haven't been mortared into that service in some way. Now, there's ways of doing it that you can still sit there. But the whole idea is when we come to church, we're coming here to come into the presence of God and to worship Him and to let Him speak to us. Let Him talk to each one of us. And you say, well, I, I, I don't know of any gifts. Well, I know one thing you can do. So I don't do it very well, but you can do it better than you think. When you come to church, it says, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. Well, I know what you can do. You can pray. When you come to church, um, you can pray. You uh, can sit here, and when the children's story is going on, pray for the person saying the story. Pray for the children to hear the story, to hear the real meaning in the story, the real truth that needs to come out in that, that biblical story, or the story about someone's life was changed by Christ. Pray for the, the one that's the pianist. Pray for somebody. You see somebody there and you go, oh, you, you just, this sense, I need to pray for them right now. Pray for one another. And as what, what uh, uh, Scott said, if we're encouraging one another, that's participation. That's throwing some mortar on our brick and putting it in place. And we're building something. 
It's not just a pile of bricks that's watching a few up here doing some things and, and, and uh, you know, go home satisfied. <sighs> I've been in church today. Very likely not, because you didn't participate. Every single one of us in here, except for uh, just because of age limits, because they wouldn't know what to do, but they're present, that's good. Maybe that's good. The parent will help pick them up and put a little mortar on them and stick them in, in place when they come up for the children's store, whatever it is. But we can participate. And, as, and I really believe it's as each person is participating, very likely if more people were praying, who knows what God would do with the rest of us. And I'm not talking about me. Uh, we've had some times when God led and somebody would share this thought and another person share this thought and one would lead to the next one and the next one and we could see that God was working and that's what he wants to do in church. Okay. The other is sensing the love that we have for one another. We can love one another. And uh, of course, if we've got something against our brother or sister, uh, it would, we would do well to take an account as we're on our way to church. And maybe take care of that and lean over to your sibling and say, I'm sorry, I was really short with you, I was critical of you, and I ask your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? We need to do that. Think of all the different ways that Satan can get us to hinder the presence of God of moving in our lives. Some of the hardest Situations sometimes are Sunday morning. Just because everything seems to go wrong. And, you know, our carnality gets stirred up. <clears throat> what a way to go to church. <clears throat> but, of course, we manage to break the smile out when we enter in the doors. You know, we don't want anybody to know we're in a hard place. Well, if you're in a hard place, let it be known. Why? Because somebody's there who can pray with you. What's the church for? It's to help one another to be at rest in Christ. What, what Dick was talking about, to come to a place of rest. Well, if you're in turmoil because you're at odds with somebody, you're not going to be at rest. So whatever needs to happen needs to be happening so that when we come together as the body of Christ, we can all leave this place going, wow. I've sensed the presence of God. It's more than I've been in church. So I've sensed the presence of God. I've sensed His love. I'm encouraged. I can go out now. I've experienced God today. I've felt His, His presence. Anyone else? What? What? Yes, Dick. Just a follow-up. Now you were, you were describing grace. Yes. Oh. <laughs> uh huh. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's good. I tell you what, uh, and, and a brick is not a, and a pleasant thing to think of. Well, this is what I've got, this great gift. Maybe it is a good gift. A brick is pretty common, right? It's pretty common. There's lots of bricks out here. This building's made of bricks. There's different colors of bricks and different sizes, different shapes. And so this, there's some uniqueness about bricks. But, you know, I mean, it's nothing to, to look at. It's not like we're holding a diamond. Whoa, look at my diamond. We're holding a brick. How insignificant. I tell you what, you hand your brick to Jesus and he will turn it into one of the most gorgeous and beautiful cathedrals and edifices of the love of God and the peace of God and the joy of God that you'll ever experience. But as he said, as long as we hold on to it, if we come in here and expecting somebody else to minister to me and not, I'm just not, I'm just going to sit here and, and enjoy myself. That's, that's not going to get to the full joy, the full enjoyment that God has for you. Place your brick on the altar, get it out there, offer it up, 
That's what I mean. Maybe all it is is saying a prayer. Jesus, help us in church today. Help so-and-so. They were, they were discouraged last week. Help them today in church. Jesus, so-and-so is not here today. Would you speak to them and bless them in a special way? Prayer. It's a gift. It's, it's a tremendous gift. And I tell you what, the simplest prayer can move the God of heaven who created the whole universe. Wow. Some of the greatest prayers that have been prayed, children and young people, were prayed by children and young people. Kara and Kate, your prayers can move mountains because you believe in Jesus. It's so important. Gabriel, God's given you the ability to, to pray. You need to pray for your mommy. Every day you need to pray for your mommy and sometimes come up to her and you put your arms around her waist and you say, Mommy, can I pray for you? And pray for her. God's going to hear those simple prayers and that's what we need. We need prayers answered, not just a lot of words. Anything else? Sarah. That's very important. I'm trusting we're, we're getting a little picture. And I know it's, it's probably a, a, a small picture. It's, not, it's definitely not complete of what should be happening in the church. Why are we here? Why are we together? And do you have something along her line? I want, I'm still kind of uh, referring. But hang on, Charles. Um, yeah. What better place to carry your burden than to a, a group of people that love you and care for you and that are going to pray? Yeah, that's tremendous. Charles, what do you have? You've got the Bible open. This should be rich. Go ahead. Oh. So much more as you see the approach. And so, I guess the point here, uh, and this is why the right of all the our faith and our profession. Yes. So, we, we need to, you know, we need to exhort each other, and what it says, stir up love in the universe. Uh, we go through the week, and we get a little bit discouraged, maybe, and, and we need to be encouraged that. Uh, Very good. Very good. A, a hermit is not the church of Jesus Christ. It takes meeting together, being together uh, as members of, of the church. Any other thoughts? Following, following God, God's lead. 
It's interesting because, you know, when you, most people think of church, one of the first things they go to is, well, you're going to hear some preaching. The preaching is necessary, the instruction that God wants us to give, teaching. So you have teaching which um, maybe corrects and instructs and guides us and helps to redefine things. Preaching sometimes is necessary to bring conviction where there's been sin or carnality to help correct that, to, for people to get free, you know. So that, that, that aspect is, is extremely important. But these other aspects are extremely important too. Uh, when they met together, um, they met for the Apostles' Doctrine. This is Acts 2.42. I want to go there real quick. And they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. I covered a little bit of this, I think it was last week, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. This is not just coming for a message. Now they continued in the Apostles' Doctrine because they needed to have the spiritual doctrine. They needed to know truth that would guide them uh, along the right path. They were in fellowship, koinonia. That is this fellowship, this is what we've been talking about here, this uh, give and take, encouraging one another, enjoying the presence of God, breaking of bread. Uh, to me, it's a marvel, and I don't know if anybody's done a book on it, I haven't seen one yet. What is the significance of the meal, spiritually speaking? Jesus fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. Here, the, the, the Passover uh, was, part of, it was part of a meal, and the church took it and continued the breaking of bread, a time of fellowshipping together around food. Um, and then it says in heaven that we're all going to sit down at the table, and Jesus himself was going to feed us. He's going to serve us. So there's something about food, and I haven't figured it out. Now, we're not supposed to be gluttons. Not supposed to overdo it, supposed to share. But there's something about food. And in prayers, prayer is a significant part. It needs to be a part of that, that, that work of God. Now, I'm gonna there's other thoughts, but I wanna I wanna read this article this week, and I don't know if I'll read the whole thing. <clears throat> What's the best size? for church. What's the best church size? Throw out a number. Let's have some numbers. What's the best church size? You're spoiling the whole thing. <laughs> I wanted some numbers. <laughs> you, you, that's right. Huh? Two? Too, this, yeah. You know the, there is a, a tremendous pressure, and 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 I know I've experienced it. You know, we want our church to grow. Now, there's reasons for a church to grow, so that more people can find out about Christ and learn to grow in Him. And there's other things that God wants to do in a church. Wants to raise up uh, missionaries and send them out, send out pastors to raise up other churches because there's. Billions of people on this earth that still need Christ. But what is the, the right size? Now some have said uh, that there's a good case for the idea of limiting a church excuse me, to 150 people. But many are not going to be that large. And what's interesting, this pastor that's write, written this blog, and I've signed up for this, or I can get on it, um, he is a pastor of a small church, and he has written this blog to encourage pastors and people of small churches. And uh, said, uh, says to, to get an idea why the, this question, what's the best church size, is a bad question, let's ask the same question about something else. What's the best shoe size? What's the best dress size? <laughs> what's the best shirt size? Okay, what's the best shoe size? 
Well, the one that fits my foot. <laughs> so the basketball fan looks at Shaq O'Neal's mammoth size 22 feet and argues, there's the best size. Do you know what size 22 would look like on Gabriel? He could probably sit down in it and start rowing in one of them. I mean, those have got to be huge. I've seen some, some pro basketball uh, player shoes in Indianapolis once. Somebody belonged with, the, with the, the Pacers. I couldn't believe how big they were. I thought, I would be ashamed to have feet that big. But the guy also stands over seven feet tall, and he needs a good base. Yes, it is a firm foundation. The only way to get the right answer to that question is to ask a better question. It's not what's the best shoe size, it's what's the best shoe size for your feet? <clears throat> Let's rephrase the question. Um, I said many times we only hear about the big mega churches. Uh, but he wants to be a champion for churches that are often marginalized because of their size. Smaller isn't better, it's just upper, up, underrepresented. Not one is better than the other, except where it's what God wants it to be. Where God wants it to be. What's the best church size for the people we're called to reach? Now here's some questions I want us to think about and go home with. That's very interesting. This can be, and, and um, what's the best church size for pastors, leadership, gifts, and calling? So we'll put those two together. Pastor Schultz, years ago, said that when he first started his ministry, he said one pastor could handle uh, 100, 200 people, could handle the problems. He could deal with those people. Today, we are in a completely different society. Uh, the dysfunctionalism that is just permeates uh, people's lives, families. It's, it's, he, he said that a pastor can only handle maybe 20 or 30 people now because of the pressures. It, uh, Norma, you're looking at me like, wow. I mean, if you could come up with a, with a church where everybody's got it all together, whoo, it'd be a miracle. You don't have that. We've got problems, we've got cares, and you add on to that the, the, the physical things that, I wasn't even talking about that, the physical things, that there's spiritual problems, there's emotional, mental problems, there's uh, financial problems. We live in an age where there's the stability of a church, in some ways, is hard to maintain, except where the church understands we're all called to minister to one another. We're all called to bring Christ in to the church service and into our meetings and into that could be a one-on-one -on -one over the phone or in person over a coffee or a coffee and Coke in my case because I want the Coke. Um, wow. And what's the best size for the pastor's leadership's gifts and callings? That can be quite humbling for a pastor. Uh, it's very easy. If you had a business, you want a bigger business. You know, whatever we're doing, we want more. Pastors, we have a church, well, we want more. And we need to come to a realization from my standpoint of I want only what God wants. And so I've endeavored by God's grace to approach Faith Family Fellowship from that standpoint alone. And by God's grace, it's put a lot of rest on my spirit. Because I'm not trying to build something, some great big monolithic uh, church of people. I know when my father-in-law, uh, Chet's father, when, when he, I think it was clear back when they were in Montana, he went up into the mountains to pray and, and finally the Lord says, would you just take your hands off of the church and let me take care of it? And he was able to do that, and he came to rest. It's not a matter of how many people you have. It's a matter of the people you have. Are they obeying God? Are they trusting in Him? Are they doing His will? Are they being transformed in the very nature of Christ? How important is that? 
What's the best church size for our church's purpose and philosophy of ministry? What is the purpose of Faith Family Fellowship? What is our calling? Do we, is it defined yet? And I'm not certain it has, but it's a question we need to ask and be praying about. We need to know what we're called to. Now, I, I know one thing that I mentioned some of these things, that the, some missions. Um, one of the missionaries we're supporting is a pro-life minister, Cal Zastro. And Karen's group down at OSA this week is part of his group. He's the team leader, which means they'll be traveling around with him. I thought, well, that's pretty good. We, they get to travel around with a, a pro-life missionary who's going to be, uh, they can learn from him. But what is it? Um, I know there's a part of me, and it may be just a personal thing. I want it to be uh, God's calling, God doing this, not me determining this. But I would like for us to be a missionary church. I would like for us to be a church that initially supports missions and that God will utilize what gifts he's given us that we can pour into their lives. They're out there in the trenches. And beyond that is that by God's grace and time, we can send out some who will, as pastors or missionaries, directly from here. Um, we should stop worrying about church size entirely. What if instead of debating if our church is big enough or small enough, we ask this question, how can we best be the best possible church for our congregation, our neighborhood, defiance area, and the glory of God at the size we are right now. So rather than putting our sights out there of trying to stack chairs in here and fill them all up, are we being faithful to who God has called us to be right now? And I know I'm not going to be able to finish all my thoughts. But I want to leave us with one thought here. I'm going to read this page here. I'm going to read all of it and uh, kind of close things off. And I'm, I'm very likely, unless God leads otherwise, I'll very likely continue with some things next week because I have some wonderful thoughts in this book, some other things I want to bring into this whole mix. And um, we need to know why we're here. I grew up in church. You know, just grew up in church. I didn't really have a purpose. You know, we went there to church. We sang our songs, heard the message. We gave our offering. Once in a while, we had communion. Um, we talked with one another. Most of the time, they talked about, you know, the weather and, you know, did you get your harvest in or this and that, sports. Uh, it was rare when I was growing up that the talk after church continued to flow about spiritual things. It was rare. I was, I, I consider myself to be one of the most blessed men. Uh, I was in seminary, had 18 hours of seminary left to finish off. I was, had been elected junior class president and was re-elected senior class president uh, it was a tremendous position of influence, of working with people. I got to work with uh, the president and some other people and did special events. I enjoyed doing that stuff. And God called me out of that and put me in a little church, a small church, associate pastor, and put me in with a person that was faithful to God. Pastor Schultz is a faithful servant of God who is not concerned about church size he's concerned that the people are walking with God and he's poured himself into that and he's a prayer prayer warrior and, and uh, in some ways I wish that I had learned more from that I know my gift is a little bit different than his but I learned so much from him and uh, was blessed to be under his ministry and to be in a sense taken out of what the track that most of the people went on their successful career. So, taking me down this path. <clears throat> so, um, 
Let me finish up. Oh, I want to I want to bring up this thought. I want to just think about it. You you probably already you're still here, so you already considered it to some degree. We try to start at 10:15. We get a late start sometimes, and uh, today we had a little bit better. Uh, and I try to stop by 12 o'clock, and I've got a wonderful clock up there, and you can see there were you know minutes passed already. I try to stop by then, but I'm thinking, I wish I wish I had more time, and uh, and and I'll keep working on making my my sermons what they need to be. But I think there's things that can happen in church that are not happening because we somehow limit the time. One of the, the examples of things that my cousin sent in his, one of the letters received, this is over in Thailand. He went back to visit a church. He hadn't been there for six years. When he first visited this village, they met in a, uh, a building with a dirt floor. And uh, he, I don't know if he was maybe even started that church. And so it's been 18 years since that church was started, and he went back to visit. The first time in six years he'd been back to visit the church. A little girl, eight-year-old girl, was now leading the worship. People that he had led to Christ back then are now leaders in the church. And he said that they had such a wonderful time, and different ones giving messages uh, he and the other two men that were with him each shared some things. And he said it went on for three hours plus. Now, I wouldn't want to put anybody under three hours plus anything boring. And I wouldn't do it unless God was leading. But if God comes on the scene, I've been in services for five or six hours, a few of them. And you didn't want it to quit because of the presence of God was so sweet and you're, you're so encouraged. You would just like to camp out there. And so part of my vision for the church is that I want us, and it's, it's going to come a little bit what I'm going to share right here. I want us to be willing. When we come to church, realize it's not just Pastor Don up there that's leading. We each have our part to bring to church. Be in prayer. What can I give today, Jesus? How can I help? Is there some way I can minister to someone? Uh, pray in the service. Rejoice. Have a testimony. <clears throat> That's why I have to finish it up next time. There's just too much. There's more here I want to give. Maybe I should stop there. No, I'm going to do one more. I'm going to do this one because I, I, I want to lead. This is, this is going to be my practical. I trust it will turn into a practical application for us. It will because Karen wrote it. It's, it's very practical. Mine would have been really theological with a few little practical points. Um, this is on her blog, Trusting Mom. It was written not a long time ago. I just finish, finished reading the book of Deuteronomy. It's called Saturation Theology. This particular reading, I'm coming away with a saturation theology. The book is instructing the Hebrews on how God wants them to live. It's not just the Ten Commandments. God tells them what it means to worship God. Establishes places of refuge, tells them how to conquer idolatrous nations, how to handle debts, Remembering God through obedience, what to do with false prophets, a list of forbidden practices, how to take care of the Levites, and so on. It seems like every area of their lives is touched as God gives them guidelines and instructions. Over and over, God says it will go well with the Israelites if they will follow all his commands. And it will not go well for them if they don't. Several times, God tells them to talk of these commands often day in and day out so that they will not forget. The saturation is not only in every situation of life, but in their conversation. The Israelites were to remember, remember, remember through feasts, discussions, sacrifices, how they handled crimes. The Israelites were to be saturated with God and his ways. 
What do you say about our culture today? Are we as Christians saturated with God? Does God not touch every area of our life, but does He infiltrate every area? Yes, we can pray before we do certain events, but God, but does God saturate it? Of course, my world involves family, so I think in those realms. Can we really raise godly children by just tokens of faith? Maybe church on Sunday and regular prayer before meals? I believe God still calls for saturation and remembering, remembering, remembering. As Don and I sought the Lord to raise a godly seed, he led us into more and more saturation. It infiltrated our schooling options. Through homeschooling, we could teach about God's ways and the benefits of those. And, and I'll mention that our choice to go homeschooling way brought us under a shower head that saturated us even more. We began to pick up materials, hearing sermons and things that saturated with, with more of God what He wanted to happen in our lives as a family. It affected our talk around the house. Discussions of what we had read in the Bible happened. Discussions about how to handle social situations in a Christ-honoring way. Discussions on how to better live out what the Holy Spirit was teaching us. Entertainment that, was enc that encouraged romance, frivolousness, violence, and materialism became appalling to our spirits. Um, that is, it's very interesting because we had a discussion one time about the movies we had downstairs that the children were watching. And according to most people, there was probably nothing absolutely wrong with any of them. But we had set some guidelines because we were saturated with the truth of God and His purity and holiness. And so the kids said, well, we'll, we'll decide what we're going to keep and throw away. And I tell you what, they cut deep in our videos. If it had any romance at all in it, they it's gone. Even Chitty Chitty Bang Bang went. You say, why? Well, it has some romance in it. Now, this is where they're at. Maybe that, that was uh, further than what God might take you. I'm not saying. There is a scene in there where the king's wife is in, inappropriately dressed. I wish we could cut that out. I like that movie. But they were determined. There were some things that God was speaking to their hearts. And to this day, it's benefited them and worked in their lives. So that was a very interesting time. Saturation affected our entertainments. We began to spend time in preparing to enhance our corporate worship times with music. So we learned music as a family. We did visitation. We started an outreach to children in a needy area. We worked to raise money for missions trips. Saturation affected our relationships as far as if people did not want to talk about God, then the friendships were strained. And we had some broken relationships even in the church there, or at least that were strained because we decided this is what we were going to do. Those that had hunger for more truth thrived. It no longer worked so well to have shallow relationships. Saturation affected our dress. It became more gender distinctive and careful in the area of modesty and discretion. Our goals in life were reformed. Now, not what career will make the most money, but what does God want me to do and how can I best invest my time for Him? Saturation of God. Not possible to do when most of your talk around the table focuses on Hollywood, sports, secular pursuits, etc. Not possible when the main goal in life is to have fun while being a good person or if the main goal is worldly success. Too often we see a mixture of worldliness and godliness, not a saturation of godliness. Perhaps our culture is missing out on the saturation aspect in the midst of our prosperity. The Israelites struggled with the same thing. When life went smoothly and well, how easily it is not to, to not emphasize God. Because God demands to be emphasized. He knows our frame and in order to thrive spiritually we need a saturation theology. He must be everything. There's a verse... And Jeremiah, my people have forgotten me days without number. There's more behind that verse, but I, 
Okay, I've given you a little bit more vision, and I'll continue to do that, and I'll continue to exhort and encourage all of us to realize God has put us together for a purpose. It's not just to uh, the normal church of things. We have a calling, Faith Family Fellowship, and it involves every single person that's in attendance here. Every single one. It means that we may have to make some choices. And one of the things, I read that for this purpose, practically speaking, is your life saturated with Christ. First, your own thoughts. Your own meditations. What do you think about as you drive here and there? Um... God's given me some tremendous insights just meditating on spiritual truths as I drive to and from work, drive through town. I'm thinking these things. What do we talk about in our home with one another? What's the conversation about? It doesn't have to be absolutely everything of God. But God is, has infiltrated our lives so much that we want to talk about Him and that there's things going on that we want to talk about. That means that we're, we'll have to focus on being more focused on Him. Looking to Him in prayer, in praise. Having hearts filled with praise. Um, how do we come to church? So the, your assignment for next week is, is, is st always starts in prayer. I feel like that's probably where anything needs to happen if we're going to change something in our lives. Start with prayer. And ask Jesus, Jesus, what do you have in store for us? What's, what's the future? Wait upon him. Let him speak to you. Let him begin to show you who you are. Jesus, what gifts do I have? Am I using them? Lord, how can I use the gift you've given me? Or use me when we meet together as the body of Christ? Use me. Help me. Any any further thoughts before I close here? Any feedback? <clears throat> I'm thinking of the time issue, uh, I don't know that we'll ever be really really short, but we could. We could be. Some God has led for some services to. They just got started the service and then. Something happened. The Lord said, that's, that's, there's my message. Go out and live it. Dismissed. But I want, us to, I want us to not be afraid if God is working. God is working. To hang around and let our stomachs growl a few more minutes. Why? We're not here for us. We're here to glorify God and to obey Him. And as, as Scott said at the beginning, to build up one another in Christ. We are the body of Christ. And if I could give you a picture, let's all stand together. So we're going to pray here. If I could give you a picture. <clears throat> Does anybody know what the word constitute means? Let's... let's <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's, that's a good. Yeah, Charles, you have. A, go ahead. Okay. It's. <clears throat> yes. Now, what would it mean to reconstitute something? How about potato flakes? How about. Um, what would it be? Oh, you know, the, the cardboard can with the metal top and bottom. Yes. Okay. Thinking of orange juice or something like that. To reconstitute is you bring it back to what it originally was, or at least that's the attempt. In one of my theology classes a couple years ago, this idea came to me. In our obedience... To Jesus, each one of us, we reconstitute 
bring to reality Jesus Christ in our midst. That's where church really happens. Now, is that making sense? We all have a part in that. And maybe the mix is we bring in who we are with a willing, obedient heart, faithful, giving our part, all of us looking to and trusting in Jesus. The Spirit of God comes and Christ is recreated in us, in our midst as a body. His body is once again on earth in a smaller fashion, but His body is here. So keep leave that, that thought with you. This is my goal. If I have a goal, maybe that's the simplest way. My desire is with the help of God to reconstitute Christ, bring him to reality, realization, here, that whoever's here together meeting and even prayer meeting Thursday night, that we sense and know his presence, the reality of Christ in us among us. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth, Lord God, and all that you've done and given. We pray that you would work in our lives. Help us, Lord, to be saturated with you. Lord Jesus, to just being open to who you are in our lives and be cognizant that you're there and, and praising you and praying to you and, and meditating upon those truths that we've, we've read in the morning or the night before. Just being mindful that you are God and you want, just like with the Hebrews, Lord Jesus, you want to be a part of everything we do. And may we begin to live that out in our daily lives, Lord Jesus, just starting right now. Living that out so that when we come together, we might reconstitute the very person of Christ in our midst. What does that mean, Jesus? It means just tremendous joy, a peace that passes understanding. We'll get a vision of things we're to do and how we're to live. And Lord, it brings that possibility, if not the probability of, of that divine, miraculous healing that you did when you were on earth because you are realized in our midst and we need that, Lord. So we're trusting for you to help. Lord, I pray for those needs that are here. I pray for, for Sherry, for continued help and strength in her body and healing and deliverance from those afflictions that she has of the body. Lord Jesus, you know specifically what they are. We ask Jesus that you would rid her of those things and bring her to health and strength for your glory. Pray for Scott and his healing and deliverance, Lord, and helping him through this time, deliver from the pain and discomfort, and pray that all would go well. Uh, Jesus, pray for Dick and this complete healing in his feet. Uh, just a, a great mobility that you're going to give him, Lord, through this. And others that have physical, emotional, mental, spiritual needs, we ask, Lord, that you would meet them by grace and mercy. Continue to help those in OSA during this week. Bless and anoint them, protect them, Lord, and guide them. May their ministry touch the lives of hundreds, if not thousands. Pray for my cousin Mike Phillips there in Thailand, uh, who has, Lord, this torn blood vessel in the brain. We don't know what's going on there, but uh, what they're going to try to do, pray that you would protect him. Help him also with this leg infection that you would heal. I pray for Daniel and Mary Troyer there in Detroit, that you would protect them and keep their home safe. Lord, I pray your angels would be about them and watch over them. And for the Paulises there in uh, China, may you meet their needs and all of their visa needs, Lord, as well. Anoint their ministry and may it be effective to the spreading of the gospel there. And we give you praise and glory. Just continue to bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.